How do you go from regular indie artists to tens of millions of free views and making thousands of dollars on your album in less than 90 days? Today, we're going to talk about an artist that did exactly that as a part of our second case study of the year, breaking down what happened, why it works, and how you can copy it to do the same, maybe even better. I'm Brand Man Sean. And I'm Corey. And this is yet another episode of No Labels Necessary. All right, all right. Today, we got to talk about an artist by the name of D1, who has made a bit of a fuss over the last few months. A bit? A a, a, a little bit. A tad. (laughs) A tig. A tizzy. You know what I mean? And there's three sections that we got to break down because I think a lot of people are going to minimize this to, yeah, you make some noise or you go viral, but how do you capitalize off of going viral? Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about the press, which is the attention. We're gonna talk about the music and we're gonna talk about the money. All right. All right. And how does this tie in together? So let's let's break it down first for the people who do not know D1, how he got attention. All right. And then we'll get into all the elements of why certain things work, et cetera, et cetera. I wanna play the clip. They're disappointing grown ups. That's what they are. Mm. It's the OGs in hip hop. It's the ones that's 40 something years old and Man, I hate when I see these gray-haired clout chasers who still talking about, and I send my young boys to come and wet your whole block up, and da-da-da, and they still glorifying this. I look at with a Jim Jones, you could do better, brother. I love you too much. I love you too much to not be honest with you. Rick Ross, you could do better, brother. Meek Mill, you could do better, brother. I love you too much not to be honest with you. Are you the face of prison reform? Cause I held, uh, are you the face of prison reform? Or are you sitting here on your new song with Ross talking about getting somebody murked? All right, we're going to stop it there. And please, again, do not diminish this to just going viral and calling a few names out. Yes, these elements are there. We're going to talk about that for sure during the press segment. But how do you translate this and make this matter? And you'll be able to do this in your own way as we talk through this episode. But this headline reads, D1 and Rick Ross engage in heated argument over charity and harmful lyrics. All right, so obviously calling people's name out directly like that, right? It's always going to bring a little bit of attention. Yeah. All right. Yeah. A little bit of attention, and he's but he's made some strong statements. Yeah. All right. That many agree with, for one. But this statement got to Rick Ross. Let's play a little bit of what Rick Ross said. Just to, again, this is for the context for people who are, who are going to be like, "What are y'all talking about?" Because we see on the episodes, man, can you play the full clip? There's no music in these. Aha! <laughs> we can play. We can play. Bro, you could do better. I gotta see you do better. Wait, wait, little man, whoever you is, until you feed the kids where you from for twenty years straight. Don't right, question cool. Rose. So, Rod Ross is going on his rant, trying to say, "Hey, man, I'm me." And you ain't doing what I'm doing on my level. It don't matter if I'm contradictory or not in your opinion. None of that stuff, right? He's just, he's shooing them off. However, as you mentioned, Ja'Cory, Rick Ross didn't get quite the response he probably expected from that. A lot of people (laughs) were on D1's side in this argument. Uh, Y'all heard the arguments that that D1 made. Essentially, quit being contradictory. Y'all are encouraging negativity in the music. Y'all are encouraging murder and things like that in the music. So with that being said, polarization, right? One calling somebody out, creating some level of controversy, creating some level of beef. Rick Ross actually responded. So mm-hmm. you can go back to the, the, the tried and true strategy, like call out somebody who's bigger than you, yep. get a response. And that can, that can elevate you. All right, Rick Ross really doesn't have anything to gain in this conversation, right? Just just to be real, especially when the conversation is what it is, he he can only lose because people then begin to uh, scrutinize. Well, why are you acting a certain way, mm-hmm. right? Like there are some contradict contradictions there, and now you're being watched more closely. Mm-hmm. So then, if you respond in a way that dismisses it, it only validates what what D one is saying in this case. Yeah. Yeah, and people start charity clocking, right? Starts being like, how many turkeys have you given up? Mm. You know what I'm saying? How many haircuts, you know what I'm saying, or kids yeah. have you sent to school? It starts, you start playing yeah. that game, which is a dangerous game because there's no number of charity that makes people happy. You right. Know what I'm Especially right. when you are as rich as, you know, Rick Ross would like us to, to think he is, whether it's higher or lower, whatever the number he's making us believe, once you hit numbers like that, there's no real 
right or wrong. You know what I'm saying? In yes. terms of like how much you can do. And and this is the thing about this, right? When something like this happens, it's on you to make sure this gets seen. Yeah. And this is what D1 does so well. If you go to his page over and over again, when these types of moments happen, he makes sure he mentions it on his page. Yeah. He posts it on his page. He's the media platform for the media he, platforms get to it. Yes, yeah. he is the media platform before the media platforms get to it. And if the media platforms post it, he's going to post it too, yep. which we'll get to that later. But I want to mention one more key moment out of all this because with Rick Ross saying what he said in response, you know, now people are really beginning to talk to it, talk about it. And Joe Budden also threw his name in the hat and responded as well. They had a quick conversation on the podcast. You can't be on one side of progress and be also a detriment at the same time. I love his message. I just don't like how he did it. Why? I just think that he can get that message out without naming a name. I mean, I don't, I don't defense, think the message think goes that, out. Yeah, I don't think it is defense. Out. I don't think we'd be up here talking about it if yeah, he didn't I, name a name. I think we. I think that general mm-hmm. message has been one uh, that a million people have said. So, mm-hmm. Like they go on, go on. There's most people are actually pretty much on D one side. Joe Biden's calling him a clout chaser the whole time and dismissing it, feeling how he feels. But this is a beautiful, beautiful type of polarization that you want to create where there's a topic that you can get your side riled up, right? There's gonna be two sides regardless for this to go. There's gonna have to be somebody, some level of opposition. Mm-hmm. All right. And a lot of times in these super polarizing moments, you have two parts of opposition and it's almost 50 50 split, two sides going super hard. Mm-hmm. But then there's rare moments where it could be a 80 20 split. Mm-hmm. And D1 was working with an 80 20 split, mm-hmm. right? Where you're actually speaking for the people in a way, right? Something that many people agree, uh, agree with. And the opposition is really just the people who have a stake in the game trying to defend, all right? There's some people that might just be hating and they wish it was them making a statement. There's the person that you are speaking against. So, of course, they're going to, you know, oppose. Mm -hmm. Then you're going to have a few people who are defending for whatever reason. That's their homie or or whatever it is, right? So when you can find specific moments, and not saying that he did this personally, Oh, like all out of like I'm strategically picking this topic and these people. I'm not even saying he did this. All right, these the moments like this sometimes these moments actually happen organically. As skeptical as we can be as as marketers, right? Mm-hmm. A lot of times these moments might happen organically, whether he just brought it up in conversation or some, you can't or you can plan it. But the point is, when it does happen, all right, we can talk about why. It works to the way why it works to the level it does or why it doesn't. And this works so well because he had a lot of people on his side. Mm-hmm. You want that as the up and coming. Mm-hmm. Because if, if it's 50 50 and you're a, a indie artist who really don't have that much of a name, you're gonna get washed out and suppressed. Who is this guy? Who is this hater? All right? Same reason Keith Lee was able to come up. You had all these people like, who is this? Man, don't nobody care why Why does this man have any power? Like, you hating on the city, da 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 And all these people like, whoa, 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 Keith Lee is right. Atlanta restaurants do be tripping. And whoa, 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 Keith Lee, like, if you watch his videos, like, he had mm-hmm. already had a built-in audience, right? <laughs> so, although he was new to this other space, he already was coming from something, had a little bit of support, which D1 already had, and had a level of track record of speaking on these topics in this mm-hmm. way. And then on top of that, all right, the topic that came up, right? The topic of controversy was something that a lot of people already agree with. You spoke for the underdog. Yeah. Yeah. I think the other part of it too is he put a name on the bullet. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I think that. And I, I guess it's really for like artists who who consider themselves to have a message when they speak out on things or in their music. The issue I've seen a lot of times with artists that think of themselves that way is that they paint the enemy to be like this broad, yep. unimaginable enemy, right? So it's like the, the best example I can think of is how many artists have we heard say like, oh, let's you know, tear down the corporations. Like, we should be against the corporations. But mm-hmm. then, you know, you hear that as a fan, you're like, well, there's a lot of corporations. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not necessarily against all of them. You know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? If we're being honest. But then you look at, let's say, a more specified campaign. Let's say, like, when um, Kanye was attacking Adidas. 
Kanye dropped faces and names. You know what I'm saying? So you knew exactly who Kanye you were. Kanye dropped faces and names. Uh -huh. La Russell, right? He talks about the industry and all that stuff, but then he has moments mm -hmm. where he'll speak on spe specifically like the, the Rock Nation deal. Yep. That was a bad deal or whatever. Joint. He mentioned that specifically. Yep. I remember when Russ was like coming up and going raging against the industry. He would speak out on specific publications. Mm -hmm. The biggest example we got right now, guess what it is? What you about to say? Universal TikTok? Nah, but that is another beef. <laughs> yeah, that is another beef. <laughs> Cat Williams. Oh, okay, yeah. Called yeah. out. That that interview was not a did anywhere near those numbers if you didn't call out yeah. multiple notable figures. Exactly, because like right? we as the people are wondering like, man, who is this enemy that's causing you so much strife? Who or what? Yeah, what, yep. Uh, it's too much left to the imagination. The specificity allows us to see an enemy, attack an enemy, if you told your team, you know what I mean, shoot the ball and nobody where the, nobody knows where the hoop is, mm. but if you say that hoop, like that's us, right, or that's where we're attacking, that's the enemy. Now I can clearly visualize, and you know, and you can get them riled up, feeling more hate. You can you can mm -hmm. make them feel like they can analyze more and decide for themselves, and then build the same sentiment. But if it's just general, it's like yeah, everybody knows that. There's some they out there that mm -hmm. might be against you or the public. It doesn't allow it to land the same. So that's a that's a really, really good point. Yo, artists, there's a lot of distributors out there. But if you want a distributor that will take you seriously, not just look at you as a number, then Two Loss is the platform from you. I'm talking about helping you beyond just putting your music on all the DSPs. That's what y'all are supposed to do. Two Loss actually helps you with your money. I'm talking about whoever is a part of the song. Dealing out the splits easily or more importantly, helping giving you an advance so you can actually create what you need to, whether that's studio time, whether that's your music video, but helping you get money to help fund your career. And most importantly, a lot of these distributors don't really help with the playlisting and things like that unless you are a signed artist. You have some kind of serious deal, but Two Loss has that ability as well. And some of our clients, when they switched over to Two Loss, They've given us shining reviews. Mm -hmm. So check out Two Loss at twoloss.com and make sure you put in the code no label. Again, that is no label, N O L A B E L, and let them know that y'all came from us. It's completely free. Make sure y'all let them know where y'all came from. No label. Let's get back to the episode. Like I said, it's something that you don't typically see in music. And we've talked about this, right? Like, it's, it's a very. Um, known thing in music of uh, you don't wrestle with the powers that be either mm -hmm. because you know you may be affiliated with someone that's affiliated with them there's a lot of yeah. six degrees of separation in music and people don't want you to make their friends mad or make their business mm -hmm. partners mad but then you look at someone like D1 right who's industry adjacent you know what I'm saying I'm sure he goes in and out as he needs to but he's not like he's not like a industry he, industry he's artist indie, yeah yeah it's like he's legit indie exactly so it's like I don't have to like, yeah, there are, you know, social repercussions that we've seen, but I'm not as worried about the detriment to my career because of this, which is what we typically see with artists who do have a message. It's like there's too many power players at stake for them to truly speak their mind against it. So they have, they're they're relegated to speaking in hypotheticals because, mm -hmm. like, if they were to say, hey, this executive, this label is who fucked me up or, you know, this ad rep or this – corporation is who fucked me over, then like that could ruin so many other things for them. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And not to say he didn't think about that. You know, I'm, I'm assuming you know, most artists who do make these type of statements have to think about that type of thing. But, you know, like I said, he's afforded the opportunity to be in a position to where like, you know, like I said, he's been doing this for years. He's been speaking about things for years. So it's not, one, it's not weird to the audience to where it can be misconstrued in a weird way. Yep. Um, and then two, it's like, all right, well, if I've been operating outside of the parameters of your operation anyway for the last however many years, like I can only be so afraid of the backlash here. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And this is what creates the reality as well. And which is why we say things like this can happen organically. He was consistent with his message before, as me and Ja'Cory talked about, mm -hmm. but even in this moment when he was doing multiple interviews, Every interview, he wasn't going around talking about Rick Ross, Jim Jones, and Meek Mill. Hmm. There were other interviews where he might have mentioned some other people and examples that they just didn't bark back. Rick Ross barked back. And yeah. then that just gave it another level of attention. Yep. And he had other situations where he was just talking generally. So this is something, a message that he's pushing consistently. And if you want to 
grow off of a message, I think it is important that there is some level of um, authenticity that people can look back to. Mm-hmm. Because if you just made this switch and you turned your life around today and now all of a sudden you calling everybody else out, it's like, whoa, 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 who are you? Which D1 talks about. Mm-hmm. He said that I, um, he said that he went to his homie's funeral. I think he spoke at his homie's funeral. Then on the way home, he was listening to his own music, his own music. And the music was basically speaking death and destruction. And he was like, man, this is toxic music. I'm making toxic music. I'm making the poison. And that was when he started to have that shift, right? So he speaks on that. Now, if he went out at that moment and started talking Rick Ross, Meek M- 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 Mill, Jim Jones, then it'd be like, yo, bro. Yeah, come on, man. Like, I know you had a little epiphany <laughs> and all, but yeah. Yeah, tuck your tail. But no, he had that moment that was in a, a, a while ago, obviously. And he's been talking this talk for a while. So do know. If y'all do want to come from a certain direction, create a track record if you really want to build up on something. Because it also allows new people who come in to come go through your past and then say, oh, snap, I really like this person because I see these messages. No different than when some people found out about Nipsey, unfortunately, when he passed. And then all of a sudden they start seeing all these videos of him speaking certain mm-hmm. messages in the past because people will be like, man, this guy was so positive. And so you'll see one video and then all of a sudden you're like, man, there's a whole bunch yeah. of this guy like on this type of vibe. This is crazy, yeah. right? So you want that, in, especially in moments like this, if, if there's going to be some type of enemy, particularly if that enemy is another person. It's a little easier when the enemy is an entity and that could be a whole other game. Um, but you don't want to create... a an easy way for the person to just call you out and yeah. just be like, all right, this is, this is some fake clout chasing stuff. Yeah, exactly. That's what happened in, to the person he was going against, Meek Mill. I think that might have been what maybe prefaced to start the conversation was Meek basically, you know, speaking out against certain things and then mm-hmm. they kind of been like, whoa, bro, like, you know, you can, like you said, you're not really the right person for this message. You know, yeah. like, cool, the the motive behind it seems to be pure yeah. and positive, but we're, we're not so sure of the messenger. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Um, yeah. and, and we've seen that in a, in a couple of different instances that were even like less <laughs> pressurized and something like this. Like Meek went through a similar situation when he was talking about label contracts and everybody was like, bro, like you the same person that years ago was all for this shit. And now that you're not in it anymore, you yep. know what I'm saying? You got complaints and like, that's a, a very real thing, especially as an artist with a message. Like if you have an audience, people are looking for contradictions. Regular fans yes. love finding contradictions and yes. the messaging of people bigger than them because they can't wait to prove to themselves that you've been just selling them a lot this whole time. like like, And that's the one thing I tell every artist, bro. Fans can't wait for them to realize that they've been right about how fucked up of a person you are. Like, they're looking for any instance to, to show them that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And the moment there's a chink in your messaging or your armor or there's a, a something they can use to detract away from it, mm-hmm. yo, you, Sean, you telling me to stop doing drugs like you didn't post a video a week ago of you smoking a blunt, bro? That's crazy. Like, you know what I'm saying? Who are you? Yeah. Think you better than me? <laughs> and, and that's where we get into the second level of this, which is still on press, but paid press. Okay. So when you have a moment like this, mm-hmm. the moment your name is mentioned or mentioned by a celebrity, go, right? Yeah. A notable name. It's go time. It's go time. <laughs> paid press, paid press, paid press. You need this moment remembered in time, documented, that you were mentioned with these names. You won some award with a note from a notable publication or a notable um, entity like, oh, because D1 had the NAACP award for whatever it was. Yep. I, I can't remember what it was. But bam, got to mention that in press, right? Oh, you got called out by Rick Ross. Got to mention that in press. Because now you're building just some level of not just visibility on the fan side, because we're going to talk about that and flipping that, but also for people to look you up, the business and organizations Mm -hmm. that don't know who you are. It's great for this moment, for sure, to keep fueling the fire. But a year from now, two years from now, when you're doing dealings with people who missed this moment completely to be able to see something like this documented and to see that, oh, he was relevant enough for this really big rapper that I do know mm-hmm. to mention, right? Yeah, it's like you you essentially, you are making sure that you cement yourself in their legacy. Because yes. the other artist is for sure not going to do that. You know what I'm saying? The other artist, <laughs> yeah. especially in most of these situations, I mean, <laughs> yeah. like I don't think that 
Rick Ross is like was actively seeking to kill the moment, but we can't act like he would have cared if the moment died off. You know what I'm saying? That would have been yeah. great for him. You know what I'm saying? Would have took him off a of fire. So it's like yeah. there are these things where, like you said, hey, I can position myself to where five years from now, if somebody Googles Rick Ross, I come up in 10% of those inquiries because mm -hmm. of how big of a moment that I've made. And you know, when you start to publicize things to that degree, just like what happened with D1, is other people start speaking on it and then the moment starts to become bigger and bigger and more cemented in it than if you had just let it be the the the, the flavor of the week, you know what I'm saying? Like the, the conversation of the week. And you know, we also live in a time period where things are almost not real to people unless they're documented on something outside of social media. You yes. know what I'm saying? So it's like, hey, like I saw this on Instagram, which was cool, but it's different when I see an article about it on CNN or I see, you know, our generation music making think pieces about it or something like that. You know, it starts to hit a lot different to the consumer and their brain. They're like, oh, this is a much bigger topic of discussion or bigger deal than I may have initially been led to believe it was. Yep. It really matters. Mm -hmm. It really matters. And I don't know, man, I, I, I think this is so beautifully done and it's a perfect example of when to get PR <laughs> because artists ask about that mm -hmm. so much. Yeah. All right. When should I get PR? And we say stuff like, well, when you have something that can be talked about. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, this is something to talk about. So it's a very clear example. Like, like I said, you got mentioned with the name of another brand. There's a notable story there. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. If there is a story there, not, oh, I dropped an album and nobody necessarily knows you yet. So that isn't a story. Beyonce dropping an album is a story because people know and care about Beyonce. There's a relationship and it impacts certain things. Cool. But for you. Like, what is the story? There could be something completely interesting. You could just be on your merry way, um, a, a regular day as a rapper or a singer, and then you see a cat in a tree and it's stuck and you save the cat. That's actually kind of a story. If you know how to spin it, rapper saves cat. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it, it, <laughs> There it is. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a little bit of something. It might not be the the biggest thing you want to attach your brand to, but it is something that you can tell a story and, and, and will be interesting and clickable in other spaces. And then over time, I mean, you know, it's just another point of reference as you build your PR space. And but there's other stories as well. You know, yeah. what I mean? but like that's an example of how it really can be something that if you want to create a story that doesn't have to like wait for hopefully a Rick Ross or somebody mm -hmm. to respond or some big brand entity to give you an award or anything like that. You can create little moments, right? Or pretend moments have happened to to, to um, be in the headlines, but you just have to understand what that looks like. And we're going to do another episode. Next episode is actually going to, we're going to touch on some of this. Ironically, I got a clip for you. You're going to like it. Okay. okay. But so that's a tease for next episode. Make sure y'all watch that. <laughs> But let's move on to the music, all right? Because you could do all this stuff, and what what does it matter if the music doesn't move as an artist? All right, you are an artist, right? A lot of artists worry about that. Oh yeah, just going viral, and they all and they like to just point at somebody and just pretend. Oh yeah, that's not impacting the music. They're not that big. You look at D One's um, streams; he's at eighty three thousand monthly listeners. I know for a fact he's been higher. I've seen him in the hundreds of thousands before. But guess what? Doesn't matter right now because you know where he switched his focus to, especially for this period of time? Selling direct. Mm -hmm. So that's not what we're measuring. We're not measuring his streams in terms of music success. We're measuring the sales of his project. Now, that is not something that is completely revealed. So that's not something that we can talk about, but we can talk about what has been put out there. $1,000 for my album, From the Hood to Harvard. That's what my man Wall Street Trapper just paid for, yo. I'm beyond humbled. I am beyond grateful, you heard me? And that's why I'm allowing my people to name their own price for this album, because streaming services could never, you dig? So when people value your heart and your art, they show up in a whole different way for you, man. Thank you. I'm on Harvard's campus right now. You feel me? Yeah, the album just dropped today, From the Hood to Harvard, available at d1music.com, you dig? And man, look, God is great. All right. That's all y'all need to hear. That sums it all up. Bansky. <laughs> a quick ban. Sold direct. He, a, one person paid $1,000. I'm not sure if any others have paid, but I know there's been a nice little amount of sales just from uh, what I've seen and what I'm aware of. So... 
how do we get here? Hey, just want to drop this quick mention. If you're looking for help in blowing up your music and your career as a whole this year, at the beginning of every year, we open up to find new artists that we want to work with and continue to grow throughout the year, which has resulted in many of the big moments that you hear us talk about. So if this time we've opened up where you'll be able to see how we approach things from ground zero, digging into your brand identity, translating that into content, advertising and full blown campaigns that result in streams and real fans. And it's only one dollar at www.nolabelsnecessary.com slash 30 days. I'll put a link in the description below. But beyond that process, we actually have ways to speak, get to know you, watch you grow throughout your process so we can lean in and offer extra advising on how to navigate what you're going through in real time. So if you want some real help without having to sign your life away, check it out at www.nolabelsnecessary.com slash 30 days. Either way it goes, best of luck to you and your career. Let's rewind for a second because we're going to get to one of the most important parts of why he was able to do this for this project, like financially, like get people to pay direct, like skip streaming, especially pay numbers like a thousand plus. Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to talk about that explicitly. This is a perfect example. And y'all are going to need this if you want to get people to pot, buy your stuff, not just an album you selling off of streaming, but just your merch and whatever to, to support you to this level. But if we rewind a little bit, all right, this album from the hood to Harvard, like he mentioned this, mm -hmm. this is perfect within the narrative of all this, all right? So he already had this plan to drop this project. He didn't necessarily know that he was going to go viral. Rick Ross was going to mention him, mm -hmm. but there was a couple of things that he did have control of, and this is what you can focus on. One, he knew he was dropping an album, mm -hmm. right? And the name of it, from the hood to Harvard, there's a story already there. He was doing that part right. Yep. Like the name brought a story. It, 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 it evoked emotion. It provided a narrative for him to then talk about whenever he's talking about the project, whenever he's been interviewed about the project, right? Yep. And he had a real backstory, like, because he literally went from the hood to Harvard. He won some award um, or like fellow. From yeah, Nas, the, what was it called again? The, like the Harvard has a, a, a Nas based fellowship that he won. Right. He won, yeah. a, a hip hop based fellowship. So he yeah. won that and it, he dropped the project basically titling it while he's there on campus. He was dropping it while he's there on campus. Yep. So he's already thinking great from a marketer standpoint. I'm going to drop this with this narrative while I'm actually on campus. So then I can do videos on campus like what he was just said in this video, I'm actually on campus right now, right? So he already probably had that part planned, yep. right? Great, perfect, love it. But then on top of that, he, as a person who's dropping a project, planned, going on a PR run, right? Like, I'm going to do my interviews, podcasts, random small podcasts, the big ones that I could get as well, I'm on those. And this is what most people slip up on. I work with so many artists they all want to get interviews biggest platforms as possible you know that but you know what most artists don't have something to talk about exactly <laughs> that's it i didn't even, you didn't even need more than one guess because you know because you know oh man do i know having something to <laughs> say when you go on these platforms is how you maximize these platforms that's what got this entire thing rolling he had a platform himself, but he got bigger platforms and other platforms, had something to say when he got there, had a consistent message that he took every single place he went, maybe used different examples, but he had a conversation for people to agree with, disagree with, begin to feel something about him and be attracted to him. You don't go on these platforms just to be like, oh, what was your backstory? Where are you from? What um, inspired the music? Yeah, like in the talk, nobody wants to hear about the music, <laughs> honestly. Yeah. They want to get to know you in an interview-based platform. Yep. Right? This isn't a listening party. Yep. And yep, yep, most yep. artists don't know <laughs> what they would say in an interview. Yeah. All right? Yeah, it's a lost art of media training, man. It's a lost art. So you have to figure <laughs> that out, like period. Like if you go on a platform, what is the primary talking point or two, maybe three, because you might want to have a little flexibility when you go from platform yeah. to platform where they might lean in a little bit better. Yep. You know, some platforms aren't good for certain conversations, but what are the main ones that you want to represent and push in that moment of time? 
and then go from there. So yeah. have something to say is huge. Yeah, I think the other thing too I just noticed, and I don't I don't even know if he meant for it to be as meta as it seems to be, but I'm thinking about the type of people that the viral message would attract, right? Like typically the type of fans that are attracted to the message of, you know, poison and hip hop, um, or, you know, they feel like the music is being pushed to control certain narratives. Typically those types of people are very anti-industry. Yeah. Um, they're traditionally very anti-industry people. So mm -hmm. this is what I say. I don't know if this was intentional or like you said, just was a nice added benefit on top of what he already planned. But it's like now I've amassed this large group of people who are anti-industry, this is the perfect time to um, launch a direct-to-fan platform because a lot of these people are probably looking at this like, hey, I don't want to support you through the, the platform industry. that's supporting the same people that are pur purporting the message that mm -hmm. we've both seen to be against. How can I make sure to support you directly, you the person that has the message that I agree with, and make sure that all my dollars are going towards amplifying the thing. Because that's that's what these fans are saying. Hey, I'm giving you this money because I like your message and I know that in order for this message to keep spreading, you got to live. You know, so I like I said, I would much rather give you the full thousand and then you ideally go spend that money amplifying this message we both agree with rather than me giving the money to, through Spotify and not only do you only get, you know, a 1% a of that, but the rest of that money has been going is going towards amplifying people who I don't agree with, who don't have the message that I want to stand behind. So mm -hmm. it's like, like I said, I don't know if if he got that medal with it, but I I see that playing a part in this. So it's a couple points there, and we're like we're already bleeding into the third, which is the oh, money. We're going we're going to touch the, <laughs> we're going to touch the money specifically, but then you talked about the industry, and I think it's a point that people should like brew on, stew on consistently. The industry. Most people are anti-industry, mm -hmm. all right? Even if they don't know it, think it actively, it, with the right talking point, you can get them to be anti-industry mm -hmm. because most people, just the way the masses works out, right, are not in the in crowd when we talk about successful mm -hmm. business infrastructure, yep. right? So going back to Cat Williams, he didn't just call out people he positioned them as people of the industry. Mm -hmm. And I'm outside this thing. I'm torn, like touching the people, seeing it's people. I'm in the small town, giving money to the small town, supporting their programs, et cetera, et cetera. And these people are keeping me out. How dare these less funny people keep me out, right? Mm -hmm. That's the positioning that he had. This one, yet again, right? You're talking about the industry. And now these people like have been gated. It's like, you didn't even know, man. You just walking. It's like one of the movies where all of a sudden, like, a gate pops up or something around you. Yeah. And you're like, you're Rick Ross. Like, and gate pops up around you. It's like, oh, snap. What is this? And like, this is like the industry bubble gate. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's like, dang, I was just having my life and everybody was in love with me. <laughs> Next thing you know, this is gate in between us. And I just look like I'm across the fence. <laughs> Guarding the industry. It's like, oh, and now everything you say, you say gets twisted into a different lens mm -hmm. it's like oh now he's defending the, the industry oh of course he would say that as an industry person he's pushing their agenda mm -hmm. like that one small little thing it's easy to get people to switch that way so like from a pr standpoint i probably would have been like hey rick rose like come <laughs> i don't know man we want to and he and he really didn't stay on this one, so he might have got that, like or just <laughs> tested the temp, saw the temperature himself. You know what I mean? He's pretty mm -hmm. savvy after he made his initial uh, response. So very much so, anti industry is going to work like until the end of time. It mm -hmm. just is what it is. But the last thing with music, he continued to drop like social media freestyles. Yeah, during this time, reminding people that he's an artist. And it's talking about some version of his message or something that's at least congruent where you're not like, oh, like he's talking all this stuff and then he's making some kind of crazy, you know, murder, yeah. kill, kill, yeah. uh, toxic song himself. So he's reminding you still again and again that I'm an artist. This is what I do. This is this is the, I do make music, not necessarily everything from the album and pushing the music is just reminding you what I am. And that's a good thing in these types of cases. I feel like. When you have this type of momentum, you can have enough emotional support 
where you don't necessarily need to be like, all right, now hear this song so you can think this song is so good. I need to go over to the streams or in this case, buy the project. No, you just want to let the support like drive the sales for you. Mm. So don't necessarily give them anything off the project. Just remind them that you rap and you can rap. Just mind them, remind them that you can sing and you know what good music is. You know, you have the talent. But let them really hear what's up when they go and see what's up. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And I think it ties, too, into another point we've made in, in this same topic, right, is when you have a moment like this where the attention from it may is bigger than possibly any, like, artist moment you've had. Mm-hmm then it becomes really important for you to place things uh, place things in view that let this new audience know that you are a music artist cuz mm-hmm. he could have he could have very easily after that just been posting talking head videos every yeah. single day yep. and taking more of like a social commentary route and that would have been completely fine in this instance like I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that but it would have aided to the goal of getting people to the music cuz that would have been this vast new group of people who would have just seen him as a as a um, commentator? Maybe eventually have made their way to the music, but they would have seen him as a commentator who makes music. Versus, he's taking the steps to make sure they know that, hey, I am an artist who has comments to make about things that's going on. It's, it's more the reverse. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Like I said, and neither of those are necessarily right or wrong. Like I said, if he had decided to go hard left in the other direction, I, I don't, I don't. It would have been. It wouldn't have been bad with a different goal attached to it, pretty much is what I'm trying to say. But as an artist, like you have to think about that. Like if I'm getting this moment that could possibly be bringing in way more eyeballs than any artist moment I've ever had has contributed for me, your next step needs to be thinking about, do I lean into this and I make this thing, like the new me, like this is now the the, the forefront of my brand, right? Or if that's not where you want to go, you have to think about like, okay, how do I as quickly as possible set pieces in place that make sure these people know what I am when they when they get here? Because it doesn't stop exactly at, at, at a hundred thousand views or something. If you got a true viral moment, you can assume that this shit gonna keep moving. So there's never a wrong time to implement that. I guess except at the end of the viral moment, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when it is literally too late. But um, but that to me is where my brain goes when clients start to go viral. I was like, all right, bro, like around something that's not music focused. It's like, yep. all right, bro, do you want to lean into this non music thing that made you go viral and we represent you around this? And if you don't, then we need to start thinking about what we're going to do to make sure these people know that you're a music artist. Yes, sir. <laughs> Again, like I said, a moment like this when you have people supporting you heavily for an adjacent message, mm-hmm. not necessarily just hearing the music, you're going viral for something else, all right? Don't let the music get in the way of the moment. Yeah, you remind them that you make music, but if you drop project music all of a sudden and try to push that heavily, you start to get people thinking: Do I like this? Is it worth X amount of dollars? Okay, I emotionally, off of pure emotion and messaging, I would have gave him a thousand dollars. But I heard the one song I heard. <laughs> <laughs> I I wasn't feeling that. That wasn't a thousand. You, you killed some of my emotion. I was, you I was know about, what I'm saying? I was about to say, it's like, we often hear about um, the message overshadowing the music. You yeah. never hear about the reverse. Sometimes the music does overshadow yes, the message. Sir. But you don't, you don't hear about it <laughs> yeah. for a reason. People make that quiet decision, and you don't know why or, or what <laughs> happened. So that $1,000 went to $200, you know, I'm, all right, or $50 or whatever, yeah, exactly. whatever it is a relative. Stream. For that person, yeah, a, a stream <laughs> or something like that, a like, <laughs> something like that. Um, and and the worst part about it is, the other nine songs on the project might have kept that emotion high. Yeah, it just might be the one you chose or the part that you chose, right? You don't, you just don't want to get in the way in moments like this, all right? So rollouts look different for different moments. And now we get to the money. So we already mentioned that. Someone pay him, Wall Street Trapper, Trapper. Shout out to Wall Street Trapper. I've heard some like some good podcasts from him. Um, pay him a thousand dollars for the project. Sold directly on his website. By the way, I looked at the breakdown of the website. Looks like he's not using any of the platforms that allow you to do it. Like some artists sell direct platforms. He, you know, put this together through like a Wix, um, Square pay, Space type site. Oh, okay. One of those type of situations. Yeah. So. You can figure out these these types of sales situations in different ways. He's doing a pay what you want. 
um, for people who kind of missed that. So he sold for that amount. With that being said, he also sold a book in his period of time, too. It was like a children's book. I don't know when he wrote it or if he had released it and it was like putting it back out again. But the name of the book is David Found His Slingshot. So David Found His Slingshot. If y'all don't know that, um, but D Run is like rooted in like Christian hip hop first, or like he he wears his religion on his sleeve. If every single song isn't out there like, hey, God, 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 Jesus, 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 you must need to be a Christian, but he's very open about his religion. So he has a lot of people who are Christians that are follow, uh, you know, following him. And a lot of his values and the way he speaks, even in these interviews, are like from that lens. Mm-hmm. So then you have a, a book, right? Along that adjacent interest of the audience that you are building. This is the stuff we talk, we talk about all the time. What do you have beyond the music, mm-hmm. right? Or merch that's just, again, the music. What do you have in terms of a different interest that makes sense to sell to your audience? For him, it's this. For somebody else, it's something completely different. All right. And who's the thing that, uh, what's her name? Sexy Red had. Remember, she had some crazy stuff. Oh, the, uh, we never talked about it on the episode. The it was perfume. Like, it was perfume. It was like perfume. Either perfume or lip gloss. Something like that. Yeah. And it had like crazy names or something. Yeah, it was like, I don't know. I don't know if we can say it. You know what I'm saying? Oh, uh, it was, I, I, I do remember it was, it was ex- wild. Explicit lip gloss or explicit clone. Wow, yeah. 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 <laughs> that was around the, the brand that she had built, like this raunchy brand or things that were kind of humorous. Like the, because the, the reality is like her bars or the, the songs and the titles and things like that. It's part of, the success of those are people are almost having fun as if it's like enjoying almost like a joke at the same time, right? Mm-hmm. So noticing that, she didn't go like hardcore, oh, this just has to be some kind of sex-driven um, merch or... She made it goofy. It was some goofy. It's goofy. Yeah, it was like a it's goofy, goofy name, yeah. Like but that little <laughs> bit of insight, right? People can mess that up, not knowing yeah. exactly why they're there. Not... Oh, yeah, they're there for this box. No, no, you want to know exactly why they're there. We're here for the humor and the fun of it all. We know (laughs) that we're kind of inappropriate type vibes, right? Yeah. yeah. Which, again, leads back to him and his adjacent version, right? We're telling the stories. It's something about the youth. He speaks a lot about the youth, by the way, and his his brand as well. And uh, whether it's in the music or talking um, topics like this, he was like, hey, the rappers are misleading the youth. It wasn't just like, hey, Rick Ross is being a hypocrite or uh, Meek Mill or uh, Jim Jones is being a hypocrite. It's like, what is the influence that the OGs and others are having on our youth mm-hmm. as well? Like that was, a, and he had some other videos. I think he talked up, uh, he mentioned Lotto and some other women and talking about the young girls, all of that stuff. So like understanding, again, the messaging that you have and then also understanding why people are there, specifically what version of the topic because every topic has sub subtopics within it. What version of the topic are they going to you for? So you can capitalize on that. And yes, he has sold books for those of y'all who want to want to wonder. All right. Oh, did he sell music? Yes, he sold music. Did he sell books? Yes, he sold books. And this is where we get into the key. All right. We talk about somebody spending a thousand plus. All right. We talk about people doing similar things for artists like La Russell who sold direct, but we also know a lot of artists who are selling direct and are not seeing those numbers. We, we, we've we seen a lot of artists with way bigger streaming numbers Yep. not do the numbers they have in terms of selling directly Yep. because that's a different thing and it's coming from more than just, am I buying because you're an artist and the industry is bad? Let me be clear. People don't care about that. Like the the, the regular normal citizen for the most part does not care that the industry sucks, your your pay isn't what it's supposed to be enough to then just buy your music at a high rate. Yeah, because you got to think, man, like the average music consumer, no matter how much you complain in their head, almost all music artists are millionaires. And, uh, yes. <laughs> One is that your job looks fun to them. Yeah. Many of them would love to be you in their opinion. Yeah. So... Like that's and, and it's not that they don't care at all. It's just that it's not enough. They might buy one time or they might spend a little bit. But what's getting them to spend two hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, a thousand, ten thousand dollars, especially in one pop? If they have it, 
that goes back to the brand identity, right? That goes back to you representing something that they want to support. Mm -hmm. Not, yo, I like his music, his music is dope, <sighs> cool, right? But I get so much music for free, it's, it's hard to just say I'm gonna pay a thousand. It's like, no, nah, this person represents changing the industry the way that they've brought out their narrative. Or this person represents a message that holds Christian values if I'm a Christian, right? This person represents just the black community and in, 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 um, like getting rid of this toxic messaging, mm -hmm. right? Like there's so many things that he stands for and represents for a lot of the people who are following him. So they're supporting more than just that. They want, I think you t said this um, earlier in this episode, like they want to support that message mm -hmm. for it to keep getting fueled. They're basically funding, you know, the idea. Mm -hmm. It's like a think. It's like a think tank kind of in a sense. That's all it yeah. is, right? Yeah. Or, or crowdsourcing, yep. right? So, like when you think about it that way, what do you represent? What is the identity? Are you saying something that I would love to say, or I would love to hear more of? So you are my you are my my talking piece, right? You are my mouthpiece that can spread the message, and you have a platform that I can't. He's saying everything that I wish other mm -hmm. people would say. Yeah, it's like it makes me think of um, when Rumble came around, right? And mm -hmm. it, it was really early yeah. in Rumble's career. People were worried because they were like, "Oh, all these alt right, you know, uh, speaking to personalities are hopping on the platform and and gaining all these supporters really quickly who are spending money." And I remember looking at that thinking like, man, that's not really the platform's issue. It's really just shows more so like the dedication of the people. Like, hey, I'm willing to follow you to the ends of earth to make sure I can support you. And your message gets heard whether you over here or you over there. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so I think we're so used to seeing that in other artistic mediums and not really music. One, because of, man, it's very rare that you see um, like an artist that even has any sort of mainstream semblance just like completely buck the system. Like it's, it's not, yeah. it's, even though we see a lot more of it, I want people to know it's still a, an anomaly. You know what I'm saying? In the, grand, in the yeah. grand scheme of things, it's like, yeah, yeah we've seen 10 artists in 2023 do it, but how many artists make music? You know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> and, and don't, actually, don't get your corner <laughs> of the algorithm twisted. Exactly. Like it ain't all, it ain't all roses <laughs> and, and, and activism out here. You know what I'm saying? Like <laughs> we've been honest about it. Um, but you will, if you speak it loud enough, you will, you will hit that corner of the algorithm that does think it's like that, and you can just continue speaking to those people and maximizing those people. And you know, at the end of the day, man, we've said it at least from a marketer's term, the best way to be successful is make a, a, a small group of people happy. You know what I'm saying? If you can continue making that small group of people happy, you'll be okay. Yes, sir. <laughs> and like, I want to mention because I did go deep in brand identity. In one of the Saturday episodes, so if y'all could check that, I will put it in the description. EJ put that in the description somewhere, but I went a lot deeper in brand brand identity because every version of brand identity is not like, hey, you are my mouthpiece and you're saying something that I would love to say. All right, some of that is I'm in deep depression and you serve that level of depression, right? You make me feel better to listen to you, whatever that looks like, right? Mm -hmm. People have different versions of that. There's multi, or you have a political group that you stand for that I love. Like there, there's different versions of brand identity and I go a little bit deeper into that, not the full like one to four, well, four hour work, workshop that I've done on brand identity, but I touch on a lot more of the elements. So if you're interested in seeing that, then um, we'll put it in the description so you can check out for yourself. But last topic to get us out of here on all of this, building outside of the music industry. I think this is a great example of what it can look like because D1 is a, a professor right now yeah. at, what is it, Tuft? You know? Tuft University. Tuft University. And I think he might still be doing something with Harvard, but yeah, he's teaching at Tuft. Right. So and if you look how he mo how he moves, a lot of the stuff he's doing is just like regular people stuff. Yeah, and that's another thing too. He's been a, a teacher. Like I know he and you go back and look at early on in his career, he was a teacher when he first ever popped off. I think he's kept some type of type of like teaching or education based gig, mm -hmm. even at like his artistic peak, you know what I'm saying? Like he was yep. always still on the ground level. And that goes back to what we said earlier, like you can be someone that's new. 
to D1, like kind of like Joe Budden, and, and I could understand how it's suspicious if you just heard about him at that moment. But for people that have even had like a small semblance of who he is for the last couple of years, like it wasn't anything new. You know what I'm saying? Yep. It was like it was like you said, it was more surprising that it went as big as it went, but it wasn't surprising that he spoke out about it. You know what I'm saying? That's it. <laughs> That's it. And which just goes back to me saying, like, you know, it's not necessarily always planned, but if you're consistent enough and your message is is pure and authentic, at some point, right, it'll get out there, get heard by the right ears, but more importantly, how we talked about that little bit of change that specificity does, mm -hmm. whew, things get hot a little quicker. So if you aren't, you know, seeing the traction you want to see for that message that you have, whatever that message is, think about specificity. Yeah. Help me visualize like I'm reading a book. Let me see the details. Yeah. And I think, too, it's, it's important to think about, like, social climate. Because I even thought about this when his moment went, right? Like I said, I think a large part of what made the messaging go was um, Meek was in the news cycle for some hypocrisy before then. And I always wondered, like, man, if he had said what he said, like, a week or two earlier mm -hmm. before Meek had said what he said, would this have went the same yeah. way that it went? You know yeah. what I'm saying? True. Um, True. You know, and then of course there were just, you know, there's, I mean, there's music based tragedies every year, but I mean, it was, this was post a couple of them. So then you start thinking about like, man, if he had said this at the top of the summer when shit was all, you know, fun and peachy keen and, you know what I'm saying, shit was going, would it have hit the same? Probably not, because the, 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 the public's head was in a different space, but you give it time, you give time for life to happen and, you know, um, events that may support your case or, you know, even go against another case you're trying to make and then the, the public attitude changes and now your message makes sense. And to, there's to also it. a public sentiment of, man, this music is too toxic right now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of conversation about this. He's mm -hmm. not the only one saying that in general. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of people saying rap has to change and this is why other genres are winning. So, and rap is going down. Is rap going to die? Like there's all those conversation and it's coming from some of the energy that um, he spoke from. So, yeah, like you said, timing really matters. But the point is you can really build outside of the industry. Mm -hmm. And he's just yet another example. Yes, you can have some people who might be a little bit more industry friends, people that you get to know. As you begin to grow in this space, you know people, and those people go on to do different things and have different positions. But you don't have to necessarily be of the industry where your entire infrastructure is – reliant on a major label or just the traditional way everything is set up on. Yeah. All right. So yeah. like, and, and the people who are connected and control everything and you can't say anything about certain groups and all of a sudden everything, you know, falls down. You don't have to be tied into tied into those systems. So let that be, you know, just another bit of encouragement that people are willing to support the regular people. However, you know, if, if it, it's, hard to make that happen if people don't know more of you right don't know what you stand for why am i paying for you when i get most of this music for free anyway i agree man if you look like every other cereal box on the shelf you know what i'm saying like what i'm what i'm searching around for facts <laughs> <laughs> and this is yet another episode of no labels necessary podcast i'm brand man sean and i'm Corey, and we out peace